objectives of the incubator is to get young entrepreneurs off the ground. You're starting in a company, you have an idea, you have a product, how do I find space? How do I meet people? How do I get advice? This is the place to do it. Good evening and welcome. I would like to thank all in attendance for taking the time to join Exceed's Age of the Excellence event. I'd like to say a few words about Exceed and the fulfilling journey I've encountered since becoming a board member. A few years ago, during a Passover trip, Harry Ajmi, who is one of my mentors and an individual who I continuously learn from, gave the most powerful speech about the importance of helping others by giving of ourselves, not only monetarily, but more importantly and more valuably with our time, expertise, and guidance. He elaborated on, it's one thing to make a donation, but it's completely different when you give, of your, when you give your business insights, strategies, and knowledge to others. I knew one of my next steps was to take what I've learned from day-to-day -day business transactions and interactions and translate my learnings to those starting out in business. To make it more seamless, a transition than what I encountered when spinning off from my own family business. Harry's speech resonated and had a deep impact on me. I walked over to him without a moment to spare and told him that I wanted to get involved and asked for ideas on how I could donate my time. He put his arm on my shoulder and with his trademark smile knew that he had the answer. An intro to Mark Ajme and Exceed. Mark sat me down and explained the mission of Exceed, where he's been president for eight years. Instantly, I knew Exceed's mission and Mark's vision was in line with my own, and Mark became my mentor and who, someone who I have tremendous admiration and respect for. Following that conversation, I met with Exceed's director, Erwin Dayan, who I've been blessed to work with to this day. Quickly after that, um, I was invited to audit a board meeting, and here I am today, a proud board member and director of programming, sharing the vision of taking this organization, members, and events to the next level. Being part of Exceed has had a tremendous impact on me. It is an incredible organization, impacting our youth and the future of the business world. The work that Exceed is doing is morphing, from its original industries of retail, wholesale, and real estate, to a vast expansion into tech, e-com, service, gaming, and many more. We are constantly transforming and adapting to the 21st century and its quickly evolving business segments. This is a reflection of not only those who are on the board today, but to the great leaders who preceded us. There are four divisions of Exceed Network, advisory, Programming, Incubator, and Women's Exceed, which I will briefly touch upon. Mark Ajmi, our president, heads advisory services, the core of what we do, advising clients on how to get from good to great. Clients come to us when their growth is rapidly happening and they need advice on how to leverage that growth. They come to us when they can't get their business idea off the ground. We provide them with life experiences, and results that we encountered firsthand to help them. Programs like this represent the evolution of who we are. We continue to grow, continue to acquire more amazing talent, and push our young entrepreneurs by supplying them with mentors that once seemed unreachable, but now accessible, many of whom are sitting in this room tonight. And to all Exceed mentors, if you're a past mentor, existing mentor, or a future mentor, I would like to thank you for helping us with our vision and mission. Our goal is to bring our clients the best talent in each sector and force them to take a moment of introspection and test their entrepreneurial fortitude. 
When you walked into this venue, on the left of the entrance is a room highlighting some of the incubator members that we work with. These are young companies that, are helping, that we are helping to steer with guidance of our incubator coach, Natasha Strolowitz. Aside from offering a professional working space, we give them structure and on-the-spot guidance and mentorship. The incubator is run by Eli Yadid, an entrepreneur born and bred in Brooklyn. You'll see more of him on the stage tonight. The Women's Exceed division is run by Kim Daba, which helps women in the community bring in a second household income, thereby empowering themselves, their entrepreneurial spirit, and their families. Many of our donors are here, and we greatly appreciate your donations. But even more than that, we appreciate your time and the time spent with our clients. A special thanks to our event partners, Safra National Bank and LM Cohen and Company. I would like to thank all of you for supporting this organization and allowing Exceed to grow into what it is today. We truly appreciate our donors, volunteers, advisors, mentors, Exceed board, and the Exceed team who continuously support our mission and make all of this possible. Without you, we wouldn't be here. On a personal note, I would like to thank my wife, Danielle, <laughs> and our children for their unrelenting support. Without further ado, we have an extremely exciting event tonight, and I'm very happy and humbled to be to introduce Mauro Porcini, SVP, Chief Design Officer of PepsiCo. Uh, I'm Mauro Porcini, and I'm the Chief Design Officer of PepsiCo. Walking on the street with a can of soda or with a bottle of water, we are communicating something to people. Buenas tardes, buongiorno. We live in a world that is changing at the speed of light, with an acceleration never experienced before. Social media are creating what I like to define as the filtration and amplification of information that are relevant to us. Internet of Things is something that is starting and it will grow more and more in the coming years. Essentially, every single product that surrounds us is becoming smarter and smarter, more connected, and we need to figure out what is our role as a company in everything we do, our products, our experiences, to leverage this technology. Meaning, is the world of brand spaces. is where your brand stands for something. Hello, hi everybody, and first of all, thanks Exceed for having me here tonight. Thanks for, uh, to all of you for coming, and in the next hour or so, uh, I would like to share with you, we divided this presentation into parts. The first part is uh, how we are leveraging a different approach uh, to innovation in a company like PepsiCo, but what I'm gonna share with you can be applied to any kind of reality, any kind of business, a startup, a big corporation. Uh, why these companies, big or small, need design today, a different approach to brand building, a different way of thinking to drive innovation, why they need it more than ever, and what uh, this different approach can do to build value for these organizations, big and small. And then the second part, will be more of a conversation that we start on stage here, but then we really hope that we can interact with you. So uh, the first part is really about setting the frame, giving you context. If you have any questions, start to write it down on your cell phone or memorize it, and then uh, let's make sure that we have a very interactive uh, session in the second part of, of, of the night. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, my title is Chief Design Officer, and when I say, uh, when I talk to people and, I'm, and I tell them that I'm the Chief Design Officer of a company in food and beverage, the first question is always, what is a Chief Design Officer? Why design in a food and beverage company? And uh, this is what I want to share with you tonight. Why these kind of companies need a different approach to brand building and innovation. Well, the key reason is that we live in a world that is, let's see if it's working, that is, it's not working, okay. Um, 
that is really changing, uh, and is changing really rapidly. Uh, as I said in the video earlier, it's changing at the speed of light uh, with an acceleration that we never experienced before in, the, in just the past few years. Uh, I remember when I was at school studying the Industrial Revolution and before that the Agricultural Revolution. Always, you know, these revolutions were driven by technologies. Today, a variety of new technologies are driving a major, major change and we are in the middle of this. I, uh, for me, it's really, really, really exciting to be part of this specific moment that our kids and the kids of our kids will study at school, will read in books. This moment where the digital technologies and, and a variety of different platforms connected to these technologies are really completely changing the way we interact with each other, we communicate with each other, we build brands, we create and invent new products, we sell these products. So there are a variety of different trends that are driving this change. I'm not sure this is working. If we can change it, it would be great. Uh, there are a variety of different trends that are uh, driving this change. First of all, internet. Essentially, internet is creating what I like to define as global accessibility to knowledge. Uh, when I was a kid and I had a question uh, that my parents eventually couldn't answer, what I had to do was to take a bus, go to the library, hope that the library was open, hope that I was going to find the right book to give me the answers uh, to my questions. Obviously, the book that you could find in the library were not the most up-to-date that you could imagine. And long story short, the most of the time I was left with my questions not answered. Today, you have a question and you take this device, you Google your answer, and in real time, you have all the uh, answers to any uh, doubts, to any question that you may have. This is creating people that are smarter, connected, savvy, very demanding, often very spoiled. This is changing completely. Therefore, the consumers we design for, we create for, is very different to design for people today to create, innovate for people today than 20 years ago. The global market is creating what I like to define as global accessibility to purchase. Uh, that means that today, if I want something, you know, in the past, I would need to take my car and go to a specific store that was uh, close to the place where I live. Today, anything I want, once again, I go in Amazon, Alibaba, I go online, I can find anything I want. Uh, through that device. I can eventually still go to the store because I want to touch the product. I want to experience it. I want to leverage the customer uh, service of the store. I want them to answer some of the questions that I have. So this idea of the physical experience is still there. But then while I'm there, I may buy directly from the competition of that store, driven usually by convenience. Could be the convenience of having that television that I love deliver for free to my house. It could be the convenience of pricing, or it could be the convenience of a specific color or finishing or model that is not available in that specific store. So this is very interesting because it's creating an amazing opportunities for innovators, for designers, for marketers, for business people, because essentially, uh, with brick and mortars, with retail, with the stores, you need to find ways to attract people to the store and to give them an amazing experience. Because if you don't do, they are not going to come to the store, especially in what we call the macro cities, in places like New York City, Los Angeles. So while in eventually in suburban uh, United States, for instance, you still want to take your car, your SUV, go to the store, it's a sort of experience that you still want to have. Uh, in the macro cities, more and more people are not going to the store. So how can you create experiences that are unbelievable and so that people uh, still come to your stores? Think about, for instance, what happened uh, with the grocery store Italy, where you go there and it's about buying products, but it's also about consuming products. It's about buying culture. You can buy books and tools and a variety of different things that are connected to the culinary culture, the culture of food of Italy, and then you can eventually consume culture with training and courses and things that happen in the space. So they're changing, and Italy is one of the fifth more visited attraction in New York City. After the Statue of Liberty, the MoMA, a variety of iconic places, Italy is one of the top places where tourists go. So transforming the experience in retail, and then obviously there is this amazing opportunity of working in e-commerce, in digital, so how can you create 
engaging, unbelievable experiences in those digital platforms so that people go there and get engaged uh, with your products and with your brands. Uh, then there is this world of social media. Social media, imagine what they, you know, think about what they are. Essentially, you select people, uh, could be influencers, celebrities, or your friends, that for a reason or the other, share your same passions, visions, interests, and dreams. So by definition, they filter information that are relevant to you, and they amplify them endless times. So uh, essentially, this is changing completely the way companies build brands, the way companies tell stories. While in the past, a brand would craft a message and impose it to you top down, most of the time, if you had the media power, if you had the, the budget through television and traditional media, today, these brands are not even the actors of the conversation. They are not saying something to you. They become the topic of a conversation happening among people. And they're moving from the ability to buy the right to talk to you, the more money you have, the more you could talk to people in the past, to the need of earning the right to be talked about. So this is, once again, changing radically the way companies, big and small, were building and are building brands today. Then there is this green bucket. I call it digital enabled communication, entrepreneurship, manufacturing, and distribution. But it's essentially, what that means is that anybody today can come up with an idea. Any of us, any of you here, many of you actually, part of this network, are entrepreneurs. You are coming up with ideas. You are creating your startups. So today, there is this amazing opportunity to, you know, where you can come up with an idea, get rather easy access to funding compared to 20 years ago. Uh, in a variety of different ways. Think about uh, organizations like this one. Think about internet sites like kickstarter.com. Think about the proliferation of funds, VC, banks that are hunting for new ideas. Uh, and in specific regions of the world more than in others, but the reality is that this is happening essentially step by step all around the world. There are so many, uh, you know, I travel the world for business and I talk with governments, banks, and, and a variety of different private uh, associations, and this idea of funding startups, funding new ideas is, is spreading all around the world. So the first point is getting access to money is easier today than 20 years ago. Uh, then you have this money, the cost of manufacturing is going down, the cost of tooling, of creating stuff is going down, once again driven by new technologies. Technologies like 3D printing will take it even more down. Uh, and so you get the money, the cost of tooling is going down, and then you can go straight to consumers through e-commerce, and you build your ecosystem of communication through social media. All these areas were the areas where, especially the big companies, were building their entry barriers. It was very difficult to go compete with PepsiCo, with Procter & Gamble, with Unilever, with many of these giant corporations because of scale, because they were, it was very difficult to get into Walmart or Target. It was very difficult to compete when they, you didn't have the budgets to be in television. It was very difficult because the cost of that tool in that plant was unaffordable for many. So all these areas where you are building entry barriers are down. So this is creating a situation where, for the first time, first of all, there is an amazing opportunity for any person, anybody that has an idea. Opportunities that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, were not there. And second, if you work instead in one of these big organizations, for the first time, probably in their history, with the exception of when they invented the product the, at the beginning of the company, but after that, for the first time in their history, they need to do serious, real innovation, and they need to do it fast. You know, it, it, many of these companies did something amazing in the beginning, and then they build their fortune out of that product. And then in the years, they have been incrementally modifying, evolving their products. And when they wanted to really radically innovate, they would acquire another company. This is how many of these big organizations grew. Today, that model doesn't work as it used to work in the past. And they need to drive a lot of innovation from within, acting uh, with the agility of a startup. Startups, small companies have a major advantage. They're fast, and they're okay with taking risks, and eventually, big organizations are more reluctant to take. Uh, 
So there is this advantage. So these big organizations are trying to figure out how to have the kind of agility and advantages of the startups and leverage also the scale that they have. And then once again, there is this amazing opportunity instead for each of us outside of this corporation, each of you, each person, to go against them. So this is also creating a new, completely different level competitive landscape that anybody needs to take in consideration when uh, we drive innovation and we come up with new products. And then there is this blue bucket, the Internet of Things. Essentially, what that means is that any product that surrounds us is becoming more and more connected and smarter and smarter. Think about, for instance, the, what Google has been doing in the past uh, several years from the acquisitions of companies like Nest uh, to the smart car, the Google Glasses, a variety of different experiments, acquisitions, innovation projects, trying to connect uh, hard products, objects, uh, in a network that is a digital network. Uh, think about Alexa, Google Home. Uh, essentially, the products that surround us are becoming uh, connected with each other, and they're becoming intelligent. In, the, in our industry, this means that the bottle like this one very soon will be smart enough to understand if it's finished, if the product inside is expired, is smart enough to communicate with the table, the table will understand if to keep the bottle refrigerated or to keep uh, the bottle warm, depending on what's inside, will suggest pairing of food, will keep your, your, your kids entertained while you're having dinner, if you want to entertain them, and so on and so forth. So there are many opportunities, and, but the reality is that many industries uh, that are more traditional, more short term, they're not yet thinking about those opportunities. So for startups outside of these industries, or for innovators within these companies, one of the opportunities is to think out of the box and understand how new technologies can change the game within uh, industries that have been in, uh, shaped in a certain way for many, many years. And I will, I will share a couple of examples uh, with you of what we're trying to do, for instance, in a world, in a, in a company like PepsiCo. Let's see if this works now. So this is, all of this is creating, first of all, a different approach, as I said earlier, to brand building, a different approach to innovation. And the reality is that either you innovate in a big company or in a small one, but you know, me working in a big company, either we innovate or somebody will do it for, our, for, for us on our behalf. There is tons of people, maybe probably also people in this room that are trying to understand how to take down some of our products, some of our brands. Trying to enter is enough one area of weakness. It could be branding, it could be distribution, it could be the product itself. So you, you, there is tons of people out there trying to understand how to take you down. Now, what is this? I mean, what, what is the major implication? The major implication is that us, as people, as human beings, the society we live in, we will be bombarded by products, services, experiences that are extraordinary. Excellence will win because either I do from my company something amazing for people or somebody else will do it for me. So the, the, the result of all of this is that excellence in products, services, and brands will win in time. Think about uh, what, what's happening with Uber and the transportation industry. Think about Airbnb and hospitality. The system eventually tries to reject innovation, but if innovation is real, relevant, meaningful innovation for people, at the end, in a way or the other, it will win. Think about uh, the music industry, how Napster was in a legal system to, to share music, and then it evolved in what we call today Spotify and a variety of other services. In a way or the other, people will win. This creating something extraordinary for people will win. And that's why we need a new focus on people. We need a new focus on human beings. While in the past you could focus on the unbelievable power of your brands, you could focus on the unbelievable power of your distribution and the, your relation with specific customers and major key accounts. You could focus on these amazing technology you could protect through patents. So many of these organizations were focusing on a specific competitive advantage they would protect, once again, with entry barriers. Today, that's not good enough. Today, you need to focus on people. It's a sort of new renaissance, a new humanistic age. You need to focus on them and create the best product for them. 
Also because, by the way, you think you know your competitors. You are designing something for them. You're creating something for them. And you think that you know what's out there, eventually on shelf or eventually, once again, on the digital world. But the reality is that while you are designing something for people, somebody else is doing exactly the same. And they're getting to market at the speed of light. And so the most of the time, you have no clue who you are competing with. And because of this, either you focus on doing the best possible product, service, experience, solution for people, or sooner or later you'll be screwed because they will get there and they will get you. Now, I'm a designer. I'm the chief design officer of this company. Why design is important in this organization? Why I think anything you do in any kind of industry, you should consider design? And I, and I, and I think it's really important because uh, many people misunderstand what design is. Many people think that design is eventually product styling. Many people think that design is nice and pretty packaging. A lot of people think eventually the design can be applied to communication. The reality is, yes, design is all of this, but design is much more than just this. Design is, first of all, is the output. So you can design a product, you can design packaging, interior, is fashion, architecture, events, is everything we interact with that surround us in a variety of different ways and in a variety of different industries. And then is a way of thinking, a way of working, a way of innovating. It is essentially this connection between empathy, understanding what is relevant to people, but understanding not just with your rationality, but understanding in your guts, with your intuition. So it's really about being into the trends, understanding how the world, the society is moving, is evolving, and taking it back to your company. Strategy is understanding what is relevant to your company from a process standpoint, from a business model standpoint, and from a culture standpoint. I may understand that people need something, a specific premium beverage, but maybe that thing doesn't make sense for my company. From a manufacturing standpoint, it doesn't make sense because the culture of my company, uh, the sales culture of my company is not the right one to sell that kind of product, and so on and so forth. Once you understand these two things, that you connect them, then you start to prototype. You start to create. And prototyping is so, so crazy important. As soon as you have an idea, start to do something. Start to create it. It's important in big organizations, and it's important if you, are, if you have a startup. When you go to an investor and you go with something that they can touch and feel and play with, it's so powerful. I call it the power of the shiny object. When you go to your CEO, you go to an investor, you show them something they can touch. There are so many different uh, power associated to prototyping. One is creating excitement, the excitement of the shiny object. And so you engage people, and they're more willing to actually invest in your idea. Especially investors or CEO that receive so many proposals for new things every day. And they need to choose where they're going to put their money. So the, the prototyping add that kind of effect, effect. And then the fact that when you create something, essentially you can engage everybody in co-creating with you. Uh, let me give you an example. If I say knife now, each of you is going to visualize a different knife. But if I design a knife here, now we are all aligned around that knife. Now, somebody may think that the knife, that the branding is not big enough. The marketer may think, oh my god, you need bigger branding. Uh, the scientist in the room may tell me that the blade is not sharp enough, and the ergonomist may tell me that the, the handle is not comfortable enough. And a lot of people may think, oh my god, Mauro is such a bad designer. He designed a very bad knife. The reality is that that rough prototype gave me the possibility to give you the possibility, to enable, enable you to be part of the creation process. Now, all of a sudden, I can make the brand bigger, or I can push back on the marketer and tell, and tell the marketer, well, you know what? I did that brand so small because of this reason. And you engage in a conversation. Now you take it out to your consumers, to your customers. You start to share things with them. And you don't need to do it with big budgets, in a big process. I mean, I design something, I go to the CVS across the street, I put it on shelf, I start to look at people, how they react. So it can be done in a very nimble, agile way. But essentially, this idea of prototyping gives me the possibility to co-create with a variety of different people, entity, and put everybody around, uh, around the table to create something to, together. This kind of approach increases quality of the output, increases the efficiency of the process and the speed of the process. Now, this is what design is. It's not just styling. It's much more than that. And we could talk 
four hours about this. But essentially, how do you apply this? We say that people, people don't, don't just buy products anymore. People are interested on living experiences. They're interested on uh, hearing authentic stories connected to these products and connected to these experiences. People search experiences that are relevant to them and are meaningful to them. How do you define relevance? How do you define meaning? What is something that is meaningful for you? Every time you interact with something, it could be a luxury car, it could be a luxury fashion brand, it could be a mass market product. Anytime you interact with anything, you have three levels of benefits that you search in this interaction. The first one is what we call the functional benefit. I buy, uh, I buy a drink because I want to hydrate myself. Uh, I buy a car because I want to move from A to B. I buy a bag because I need to put something in that bag. The second benefit is what we call the emotional benefit. Essentially, I buy something because I just love it. And by the way, it could be brand-driven or product-driven. I buy a Louis Vuitton bag or a Prada shoe because I really, really love that brand. Or I buy a cashmere sweater because I really love uh, the material, I love the fit. So it could be driven by the product, driven by the brand, or ideally, in an ideal world, driven by both. But it's very personal. It's you and the product, you and the brand. And then there is a third layer, a third benefit. This is what we call the semiotic benefit. Essentially, that thing, that Prada shoe, or that cashmere sweater, or that watch, or that car, is saying something about you to the rest of the world. Everything that surrounds us, uh, the car we drive, the dress we have, the haircut we have, even the books we have, the friends we have, anything, anything that surrounds us, is telling a story to the rest of the world, 24-7. Each of you right now, without saying a word, you are telling a story about yourself to me and to the people that surround you. Every time. This is what we call the semiotic value. This crazy suit that I have today, my, my watch that doesn't tell the time, anything is telling you a story. And by the way, I try to art direct my story, but then you interpret your story in your own way. Maybe I feel stylish and cool and you think I'm kind of crazy. So it's, it's, you know, it's like a poem. It's something you put out there and then people interpret in a variety of different ways. But as a designer, as an innovator, as a business person, when you create your brand, product, your startup, this is what you need to think about. What is the functional value of that product? What is that emotional, personal connection driven by emotions that you, I'm going to create for them? And then what that brand and product is going to tell about that person to the rest of the world? And this is more obvious when you work on lu in luxury. It's pretty obvious that if you buy a Rolex or a Prada shoe or, or a Ferrari car, you know, you are going to have the semiotic value. But the reality is that this can be applied to any kind of product and category. And there are so many innovations, so many brands, so many industries where they apply that kind of approach and they change the industry. One, one, of, one example is Method. I don't know if you're familiar, Method det Detergents that was launched many years ago, I think about 15 years ago, in Target in the United States, they were playing so much on the semiotic value. Method, beautiful packaging, totally unexpected for the category, sustainable products. So changing completely the kind of conversation, both the emotional benefit as well as the semiotic value in the detergent categories. But there are so many different examples of applying that to innovate in an industry. Now, how do you design experiences that are meaningful. If we say that people buy, not buy just products, they buy experiences, these experiences need to be relevant and meaningful to them, how do you do that? What is the approach that you use to create something that is meaningful to them? Now, there are many answers to these questions. We could talk for hours about this. This is just a glimpse of the approach that we use uh, in, in, uh, in PepsiCo. You know, every time you interact with products and brands, there are three levels of relation that you create with products and brands. And these are my, my, my free, this is my free interpretation of the theories of a human scientist. His name is Don, is Don Norman, or Donald Norman. Uh, and if you want to read more about this, you can uh, check his book published in 2002 called Emotional Design. And essentially, <clears throat> Donald 
talk about these three levels of interaction that you have with people and with spaces, with environments. And then once again, I'm applying this to the world of uh, design and products and brands. The first relation is what we call the visceral relation. It's when you see a beautiful man, a beautiful woman, an interesting person, uh, or a beautiful landscape, and you're like, wow, it's the butterfly in your stomach, it's something that you react viscerally to. You know, you, you are in front of something, you don't even understand what that is, but you have a reaction. And it's not that, that easy to create something like this, because every time you try to do something that creates a reaction, it means that you're also creating something that may be polarizing, that is risky by definition. Uh, this is a launch we did recently, and it's been extremely successful for us. It's sparkling water uh, with flavors. is one of the many projects, one of the many brands uh, that we are launching to create something in the world of health and wellness, especially for the younger uh, generations. Uh, they recreate the same kind of excitement and fun of the soda category. And, but to do something that is really extreme, really polarizing, is often also very risky for uh, these, especially big organizations. People may love it or people may hate it. And when you want to have big volumes, it's not that easy to create something like this. This is one example anyway to say that the first thing, the, the first rea reaction that you need to create in people is that visceral reaction when they see a piece of packaging, when they see a product. So how do you create that kind of emotional connection, a reaction across a variety of different products and categories? And these are some of the example from our world. And it's not just packaging driven. Everything we do is always an ecosystem of experiences, of products, and stories connected to it. Uh, collaboration in the world of licensing. These are some of the pieces we did with Jeremy Scott uh, in the world of fashion. Uh, refrigerators, communications, and experiences, and parties, and events. So trying always to create a full ecosystem that is not just driven by the product itself, but that it can engage people, and people want to talk about in, uh, in their social media platforms. Uh, this is another um, very successful launch that we did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, is a premium mass water that we call life water. And every bottle uh, essentially is a canvas for artists to express themselves. Every three months we create a new uh, collaboration. Uh, we have, uh, the, the, the purpose of the brand is the one of supporting emerging artists. And every three months we, we uh, define a sub-purpose, a specific uh, theme of the collection focused on a cultural tension. For instance, the second collection was Women in Art. Uh, we did uh, a collection uh, in, uh, in, uh, about the connection between digital and art. It actually was a freeze uh, uh, last week. And if you think about the three levels of interaction, uh, viscerally is, is uh, you know, when you see the bottle, uh, the, and, and is that uh, first connection, that emotional connection when you see the bottle. And then uh, the idea of keeping changing the bottle creates uh, this excitement, continuous excitement every time you go to the store. So you are always surprised by something new that is happening. Then the bottle becomes a sort of accessory when you walk on the street. It's something you want to share with people. It's something that you want to be seen with. So it's becoming a way to communicate about yourself. Uh, is, is creating that kind of semiotic value I was talking about before. So emotional and semiotic connected together in this product has been extremely, extremely successful for us. It's, it's product driven, it's packaging driven, but then once again, it's the entire ecosystem with a variety of different events and experiences we create around the product and the brand itself. The second level of interaction, we say the first one is the visceral, the second level of interaction is what we call the interactive relation. Essentially, somebody, uh, in the analogy of Don Norman, you saw this interesting man or woman, and you go out with them. And you have this, you know, satisfaction is both emotional and rational. You are in vacation in an amazing location, and, and you just love to be there. You are in vacation in Bahamas, and you think about your friends back in New York in the rain, in the cold. Is, is, is this emotional and rational connection that you have with people, with experiences, and therefore also with product, products and brands. This is one of the very first products we designed when we created the design center in PepsiCo about seven years ago. 
uh, is a, what we call a fountain, is a dispenser of drinks. There is a screen that is the size of an iPad where you essentially you select your base. It could be water, it could be a tea, it could be a cola. And then you add your flavors and you get your customized drink. You can add up to three flavors. You can have thousands of different combinations. And the screen uh, is also, this digital device is also a way for us to communicate to people. So it's not anymore just about the transaction. I go in front of a font and I get the drink, I get out of the way. But all of a sudden I have a platform to communicate to people. I could tell people what is the drink that Beyonce is choosing the week, what uh, your colleagues at work are drinking, uh, what is the, the, the mix that uh, the students of your school like the most in that specific day. Uh, and then in the meantime, I can also uh, collect the information about what people are, the different consumers are creating in front of the machine. So I have a real time picture of everything uh, is being created around the world. And this is all data, this is all information that is feeding our innovation pipeline to then create products and drinks that eventually go in the retail market in traditional markets. This has been extremely successful for us. That was the first product and then we've been building uh, in the past few years a variety of different products around that kind of technology and that kind of approach. Or this is another one that I personally really, really love and I really hope that it's gonna be very successful because essentially is one of the variety of different products that we've been launching in the past few years that focus on two very important themes. One is sustainability and one is health and wellness. Essentially, this is a reusable bottle. Uh, you fill it with water, tap water, and then you have these pods with two chambers. One, on the bottom you have the flavor, on the top you have a solid component with a functional value. It could be spirulina, it could be uh, coffee beans, uh, it's oat fibers and a variety of other ingredients. And so you fill uh, the bottle with water, you put the pod in and you, get, you mix the three components and you get your fresh drink on the go. So this is our, and, and these are all mixes with low calories, functional value. So is our, one of the many projects we are driving to market to try to give a solution to people, to consumers, to the plastic problem, and then to uh, the world of health, and, in, in the world of health and wellness. Combining those two platforms, the platform of equipment and the platform of uh, Drinkfinity, uh, we've been innovating in the world of Gatorade. And this is a video that, is gonna share, uh, that I'm gonna use to share with you what we're doing with this new platform that we call Gatorade GX. Your game is our lab. Introducing the future of sports fuel. Gatorade GX, your real-time hydration coach. Gatorade GX tracks fluid loss before, during, and after training, capturing every moment of sweat, measuring electrolyte and sodium loss in real time. Fluid intake is continually monitored with on-the-fly guidance, showing you when to hydrate while pacing your intake. Analyzing your fluid balance, Gatorade GX unlocks your personal fuel strategy. Recommending fuel formulas based on your electrolyte and carbohydrate needs. Conveniently delivered through an innovative equipment system. Replacing what's been lost when you need it the most. Track, analyze, and optimize your performance. Gatorade GX, built to fuel, customized for you. This is an example where that balance between emotion and functionality is really, really important. It is an example out of many where we are trying to take the platform of Internet of Things and new technologies and embed it in a, in a product, transforming the product itself, a drink, eventually in something that is bigger than a drink. Can Gatorade in the future become a service and not just a drink? Uh, and with that kind of mindset, obviously, we're working on a variety of different uh, products and platforms. So we say that the first 
relation is the visceral relation, the wow effect. Then you have this interactive relation. And then the third one is what we call the expressive relation. In the analogy of Don Norman, once again, is when you go uh, out with this person, this man, this woman, and you want to share that experience with everybody, with your friends, with your family. You're back from your vacation, you share the pictures of your vacation with the world in your social media platforms and privately. It's the pride and the joy of being associated to something, to an experience, to a brand, to a product. Uh, this is an example coming from the world of Pepsi, Soccer World Cup. It's the first one of, out of many other projects that we did in the past years. Uh, we are not the sponsor of the Soccer World Cup. Our friends from Atlanta are the official sponsors. But we are the sponsor of many uh, soccer players, like Leo Messi is one of them. So uh, we decided to take these beautiful black and white pictures with this famous photographer, Danny Clinch, of each of them. And then in this case, in a live event in London, we had the street artists, different street artists coming from the countries of the different players, painting over, over the photography. The, the, even the moment of the painting became content, is, is, you know, the event became content that went viral online, but mostly this became our campaign. So it was not about celebrating the, the, the product Pepsi, but more about uh, what Pepsi stands for. Is the purpose, is this idea of live for now, carpe diem, enjoy the moment. We took the art and we then created a series of collaborations with a variety of different brands, Del Toro shoes, Penguin uh, jackets, uh, Bang & Olufsen headphones, Shot skateboard, and many other things. And then we created a partnership with uh, Bloomingdale's here in the United States, with Colette in France, with a variety of premium stores uh, to promote these products, to sell these products and create events uh, in different locations around the world. This has been extremely successful for us. We do it with Pepsi. We do it with a variety of different brands. This is Gatorade and, and, and Michael Jordan, Nike. Uh, or this is Pepsi in connection to uh, another pop culture uh, platform. Uh, is the movie industry. In this case, is the movie Back to the Future 2. You may remember what Marty McFly uh, uh, was doing when he went to his future, he went to a bar, and then something happened, he asked, You, you must have special! Hey, 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 All I want is a Pepsi. So this is what he was asking, and that day, that night, was the uh, 21st of October of 2015, and so that day, at, uh, at the same time that of the time machine, at 4.29 a.m., we dropped in Amazon Pepsi Perfect, uh, and we sold out 8,000 pieces in two seconds. Uh, we, I mean, it's literally like this, and then we, we had a lot, a lot of fun. They were really, really upset, and we had to run a second production. Today, you can find those products online for, what is this, $200, $300. This is my favorite picture. Uh, there is not even the cola inside, it's just the packaging. We sold more licensing, so the bottle, but also uh, hats and shirts and a variety of different products uh, in a week with Pepsi Perfect than in an entire year with Pepsi. So this is an example of connecting a brand to something that makes sense for people. It could be art, it could be sport, it could be the movie industry, but how can you communicate and create conversation, create buzz, having people talking about your products for you, becoming the ambassador of your brands for you uh, in these ways. And this is the challenge I think, especially the big brands are living today, uh, where television is not as relevant as it used to be. Uh, and that's why these are approach to brand building driven by experiences is becoming extremely, extremely important for all of them. Now, going back to these three levels of interaction, visceral, interactive, and expressive, uh, every time I talk about this, I've been talking about this now for 15, 20 years, everybody nods. I mean, it's the way we behave with other people, you know, the visceral, interactive, expressive way of connecting with other human beings. Now, to translate this from a business standpoint, how can I create business value if I design in the way, if I innovate in the way? If I create the visceral effect, I'm gonna drive emotional impulse purchase. It's going to a store with a list of things to buy and then you fall in love with things that you didn't expect. 
the interactive one is emotional satisfaction and loyalty. It's being in line outside of an uh, Apple store to buy the latest uh, uh, iPhone or the, the latest product from the brand uh, driven by trust, driven by even if you never ever touch the product, you just trust the company to do the right thing for you. The expressive relation is communication and spontaneous PR. It's word of mouth, it's people talking in a positive way about you. It's transforming your consumers in your brand ambassadors. Purchase, repurchase, recommend, or if you go back to the user perspective, is about creating the wow effect with your product and the ecosystem of communication. It's about creating engagement that is both rational and emotional. And finally, it's about creating pride and joy in people in being associated with your products and your brands. I'm gonna stop here so we can have a conversation. Uh, and Fantastic. Thanks. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna take a risk here and say, uh, are you from Italy? <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> you talk like a Ferrari. Let's just say that you know we uh, uh, we can't thank you enough for sharing some of your expertise and your knowledge. All the young and uh, not so young people here really appreciate it, and uh, including me. I had a chance to meet you in your office, and uh, I could say that I'm equally as impressed uh, today as I was back then. Uh, thank you for sharing all your information with us. One of the things that, as an entrepreneur and, and as a human being, that's so important is to have someone to look up to, is to have someone that, that you look at for a specific purpose, uh, and, and you see that as, a, as an inspiration, someone who you consider a mentor. I think Harry touched on that a little earlier. Uh, do you have any, anyone you want to mention, anything like that, that that inspires you, someone that you look up to? Well, I mean, I, I have two mentors that somehow changed my life in a variety of different ways when I was in my 20s. Uh, and I'll talk about them in a second, but even before that, I think there is a beautiful opportunity today that I didn't have when I was younger. Today, you can elect anybody in the planet to become your mentor. Because when in the past you needed to have some form of interaction with these people, so you needed to connect and talk to them and be in proximity, today you can choose President Obama or you can choose, you know, an in Nicolas Negroponte, the founder of MIT Media Lab, to be your mentor, and you can start to follow their speeches. You can, there is so much material about them, about their thinking. About, so essentially you can create what I call the virtual mentors everywhere. And then you can even write them. It's not, I mean, maybe to Obama it's more difficult, but to many others, it's not that difficult to write them. And if you insist a little bit, there is a high probability they're gonna even answer to you. So I think it's a beautiful, beautiful moment today to uh, really choose the kind of mentor you wanna have and proactively do an effort to be inspired by them. Now, in my own way, Many years ago, I tried to do something similar, uh, but again, I didn't have this platform, so it, the, my interaction with those mentors was somehow limited. My first mentor was the CDO, the chief design officer, the title back then was a different one, of Philips, uh, and so he was the CEO of Philips Design, so he's the, the head of design of Philips. Italian, his name is Stefano Marzano, but he was living in Holland, and for anybody studying industrial design, uh, especially in Europe, but all around the world, Stefan was like God. I mean, he was really changing uh, the way of doing design in, in the industry. And he was the friend, uh, so I would study about him in the books and everything, but he was also the friend of the father of uh, a, a girl that was coming to school with me, that was in high school with me. So I remember one day I was in, the, I was the first year of university, I was in a bus in my city in Varese, outside of Milan, and she calls me and she's like, oh, Stefano is here from Holland and you wanna pass by to have a coffee with us, and so you meet him. And I remember I had so many things going on that day. I had really, you know, a series of commitments that I couldn't change, I couldn't move, 
And, and I, the most of the people probably would have said, you know what, I would love to, but I have to do this thing. And I was almost about doing that, mm -hmm. but then I was like, you know what, fuck it, I go. <laughs> so I drop everything and <laughs> I just went. I follow my instinct, I'm very emotional, I just went. And that meeting changed my life. Wow. Changed my life because the guy inspired me a lot, a lot. I, you know, he, he started to tell me things he was doing. I was like, my God, he, wow. much more than what I was thinking. And how old were you? I was 20. Wow. And, and then I started, I became a stalker on him. You know, I started to <laughs> harass him, essentially. No, I, you know, I, I always loved philosophy uh, when I was at school, and I was reading of this philosopher that would write letters to each other, you know, and the mentors, and, and so I was really into that. Philosophy was a passion of mine. So I started to write letters to him, like, like on paper, uh, emails, I, no, they were, yeah, emails, they were not emails, really. Um, yeah, so letter, the probably was not reading, but he did something, and so for years I started to do that. Uh, two, three years later, he did something that for him was almost insignificant, but for me, once again, was really important and really changed my life. Uh, he sent me two books uh, that he published on um, Philip's vision of the future. And he had these books in English, but he, has, he, he had also the books in Italian. He published a version also in Italian. But he sent them to me just in English. I was 23, and I didn't speak a word of English. Because at school, I studied French, not because of my choice. I had to study French for a variety of different reasons. But long story short, I was 23, and I didn't speak a word of English. And Stefano sent me this book, and he writes on this book, wow. I'm sending them in English for you, so you can practice your English, and you can study English. Because before, in a previous meeting, he told me, look, if you don't study English, you're not going to go, you know. Far. Now, we're talking about 20 years ago. There was no social media. I mean, in, English was not that important eventually if you wanted to have a career in Italy. Today is, is an obvious choice. Back then, it was not. So I received these books, and they really motivated me. And I, by then, I won a scholarship to go to France to study for one year. I decided to give up the scholarship, wait one more year, and try, because it was not Sure, but try to have a scholarship in an English-speaking country. Now, I didn't, my, my family was not a wealthy family, so they, they were not going to be able to give me the money to go study abroad. So either I was getting that or I was going to have problems. But I, I took the risk. I renounced to the, the first scholarship. I waited one year, and thank God I won the scholarship to go to Dublin. And at 24, I, for almost a year, I stayed in Dublin, studying design, so university level design, in a language I didn't know, but I came out of the experience speaking English, and today I'm here speaking my broken Italian English, in my broken Italian English to you. But that was really, you know, it really changed my life. And there are, I think there are a few lessons in this. One was my proactivity to become a stalker. <laughs> my proactivity to really push and push and push. So anybody who want to have a mentor, you need to be part of it. I mean, you need to put an effort. You got to be a this. stalker, basically. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, by the way, today, if people write me, I, I receive so many messages in social media, you know, in LinkedIn, and I cannot answer to all of them. But if I see somebody, especially young people, that keep writing and write, mm -hmm. writing in a nice, uh, respectful way, but also with energy and enthusiasm and everything, at the end, I answer. And you have no idea how many young people I met coming, you know, some of them here in New York, some of them coming from LA, coming from Boston. They come and they spend one hour, two hours with them, and, and it's the little thing, is, is Stefano Marzano writing that thing? It cost nothing to him, but it changed my life. Spending one hour with somebody to give them maybe a different vision of what design can do. For instance, one of the problems of many young people is that they have no idea that this design thing exists. They think the design is styling of a car or a dress. It is that. It is beautiful, and I respect that, and it's amazing. You know, I, I love those kind of products. But there is so much more, and it's a beautiful career, and many people are not even aware of it. So doing a little effort to give back in this way is very, very important. There, there is another suit? mentor, but maybe you know, another time. Can I borrow your suit? <laughs> <laughs> if it fits, yeah. Actually, you know what? I want to I wanna, I wanna mention also the other mentor because there is another lesson that he gave me. Uh, his name is Claudio Cecchetto, and he's, he's a celebrity in Italy, and he was a big celebrity, especially back then. 
Uh, the guy is, uh, is a DJ, is a producer, is, he invented the most important Italian radio, radio DJ, and he did many other things. And I remember, once again, through common friends, but this time the friend was his assistant, so his, you know, my network was not a great network because I was coming from a little city uh, with a humble family, so it's not that I had these connections. I was trying to create my connections, but in a very unaware way. I was not aware of what I, of what I was doing. Very emotional, very random. But once again, a friend of mine knows the assistant of Claudio Cecchetto. So through that connection, we get a meeting with Claudio. Now, many people will go to Claudio. Today, you will take this, you will take a selfie, you spend some time with him, and that's all. Back then, I would take an autograph and go. Instead, we're like, wait a second, I mean, this is an amazing opportunity. What could we do with Claudio? So it was myself and this couple of friends of mine. So we decided to go and propose him to do a project together. And the guy was investing in the moment in, uh, in digital, in internet. It was 1999. It was very, very early. And, and he was very intrigued by the world of digital. So we went there. We were just, you know, I just got my master's degree. Uh, we were really good with 3D softwares and technologies. So we decided to propose him uh, to use 3D software and technologies to design internet sites and, and to innovate in that field. So he saw that, and he saw you know, young kids with a lot of enthusiasm and mostly technical skills, because you need to have know-how. And he was like, you know what? He asked us, what do you do? I was starting to work in Philips, and, and, and we bluffed, and we were like, oh, we, uh, we want to build a company together, you know, a studio. And he, he told us, okay, do it with us. So one month later, it was a dream job. I started to work with this big celebrity. Uh, and a lot of work was, at the beginning, uh, managing the identity, the image of many singers and celebrities in Italy that he was managing in his portfolio. So for me, you know, it was very young, super exciting to work with all these celebrities, uh, it, mostly leveraging our uh, digital uh, know-how, and so working on the digital content, inner sites, uh, CDs, and everything. But here come the lesson that he gave us, something that really, really changed my life. The guy was like, okay, you need to, we need to do this work for the celebrities to get cash. We need money you know, for the company. But the reality is that we don't want to work by hour or create a service for somebody else. We want to create something that nobody ever did before. We want to create something that is priceless. He was talking about innovation without ever using the word innovation because he's not a strategy guy or a business guy. He doesn't come from McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group. But it is what today we call innovation in our world. And his idea was, really, every time you do something, you need to do something that nobody else did before. We started to work on what we call today Bitcoin. In 99, 2000, we were working on the idea of digital cash. Uh, we started to work on a variety of different, and it was too early, obviously, but this, this is part of the innovation game. Sometimes it's too early, you, you need to have the right idea, the right timing, but the lesson for me was that everything I do, it could be the redesign of a brand, or it could be inventing a product that doesn't exist, it could be anything, it could be the most banal and stupid project, you need to do something extraordinary, something that nobody ever did before. You really need to keep innovating. Uh, why is it important? Because it doesn't require extra effort. It's mindset. If you enter in that kind of mindset and everything you do, you always need to innovate, you're not gonna do more effort than the ones that, that don't think in that way. This is the, it's the same amount of work. It's just a different way of thinking. Nice. Thanks. I, I think everyone in the audience here, uh, including myself, uh, is either waiting on or had a certain breakthrough in their career that is enigmatic. It was that one time that that I, I you know, I persevered and I got that client, or uh, I aced that interview and I got that job. We, some of us, again, still haven't had that moment. What could you tell people uh, or inspire them that haven't had that moment yet? Uh, maybe they don't have the opportunity with education as much, or maybe they don't have the right network. What is the one thing that, that, that they should feel inspired about? What was your breakthrough moment that you could share a little bit? Well, so I get to the breakthrough moment, but I think it's even more interesting how I got there more than that specific moment. And, and I'll actually start with my parents. Um, 
because they really, I, I realized later on in my life how important I've been in my life. And my mother uh, was in love with literature, writing, reading, culture. For her, culture was the most important thing. And the other thing was be a good human being. And she was really, you know, those two things. And she never put pressure on me. She never told me, you need to have an amazing culture. You need, you need to behave in a certain way. I mean, I mean, she would do like any mother would do. But mostly it was by example. I mean, she was really fascinated by knowing things and reading and everything. So I would observe her. I'm like, oh, I, wanna, I want that. I want to be like that. I want to even maybe just to please her. So that, that's one dimension. The other, my father was an art, is an architect, but he's been painting all his life. So there was all the creative world that I really, that really fascinated me as well. But mostly, they never taught me you need to make money. They 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 never talk about networking and no, connections. No, we're, and we're Jewish people. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but the point is that I made the money. Then I Come, made the money. money. My point is. Your goal cannot make money, cannot be make money. Make money should be an output of, of what the, you do. The result. So do something amazing, and then the money will come. But if you start with making money, you are screwed in a variety of different ways. First of all, because it doesn't mean that every, by the way, I, I talk with so many young people, and often it's either making money or be successful. Success defined as, a celebrity, right? I mean, I want to be rich and successful. And the reality is, if you start with that kind of goal when you are young, you're really screwed for a reason. There are very few people will reach that kind of goal. So even just because of that, it means that many people will be extremely unhappy in their life because they didn't reach that goal. But if you start from the goal of, I want to have culture, and I want to be a good human being. And by the way, it sounds really rhetorical, but I really believe in it. I mean, that's really what they taught me. And it's not like, oh, I want to be, you know, I want to have culture just for, no, it's the beauty of knowing things, and then teaching them, and mentoring people, mm -hmm. and sharing them. And eventually, my, my dream as a kid was actually to write a book, and also to be, uh, a topic of a book. I mean, that was the dream I was having. Not driving expensive cars or anything, but simply because I was thinking, I will never reach that. It was not even a, a dream, a goal. Obviously, I would have loved it, but, but it was not a goal. So if you are driven by creating something amazing, so culture is just an enabler, it's a platform, but what I'm talking about here is be driven by creating something that creates value for the society, for people. It could be a new product, a new brand, a new service, something that changed the game then money will come. Eventually it will come is what you're saying, as yes. long as you stick to your plan. Yes, and now, breakthrough moment. Well, I, 2010, I moved to the United States from, from uh, Italy. I moved not to New York, I moved to Minneapolis. <laughs> so imagine from Milan to Minneapolis to Minnesota. And you, as, as you can imagine, I was not, I was following my dream. You know, I, I didn't move to the US because I wanted to move to New York, that is an amazing city that, Right now, I fell in love with and I deeply love. No, I, I was following a dream. And if this dream was bringing me to Kenya or to Brazil or to Korea, I would have gone there. So I was following this dream. And, and I, uh, I was working at 3M, the technology company uh, from Minnesota. And I already worked there for seven years. So it was after seven years working at the company, finally moved there. And in those seven years, with a big dose of resilience and optimism, I've been working on a variety of different projects. And, and, and many have been successful, but the company was very big, 65 different platforms and yeah, businesses, really. gigantic. So very few people really understood what was happening with designing the company. Because they, each of them was looking at his own business, brand, territory. So finally, somebody understand that there is an opportunity with design. They understand that they should move me from Italy to their quarter. Mm. I go there, and, but still there was not a great awareness about what we were doing. But we are doing a lot of things. So what is the breakthrough moment? Well, when I started to speak at conferences here in the United States, all of a sudden the platform was the global platform and not the local Italian platform. Mm -hmm. And Fortune, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fast Company, they were like, wait a second. I mean, this story is really interesting. Yeah. So they start, I started to receive awards, especially one that was really the changing game. 
Fast Company made me master of design uh, of, in this country in 2011, I think. They did a huge, big, big, long article. They came to 3M, they interviewed the CEO, they interviewed many people inside the organization. So why that was a breakthrough moment? Because all of a sudden, 3M read this article, you know, from the CEO down, the company read the article, was like, wait a second, this is us. This company is doing it. So they look at themselves in the mirror through the eyes of an external entity, and they were like, wow, I mean, we are doing this. Now, the lesson for me, then, you know, I became very strategic in these things, you need endorsers that are outside of the company because within the company, people will look at you and you will have jealousies or you will have people that don't really understand the big picture or they are trying to protect the status quo and the inertia of the organization. So leverage as much as you can people out, outside. And this could be the media, but even more powerful than the media are the customers. If you do something and then you have a customer uh, of your company that is endorsing what you're doing, is going back to your CEO, your, your, your colleagues, and is telling them, oh, but that guy that you hire, or that function you are building, it could be design, but it could be a new digital platform, anything. It makes a lot of sense. It's gonna create an awareness and a sense of urgency to speed it up amazing inside the organization. So, so what, what, I'm gonna open the floor for questions in a second for time purposes, but was there like a specific item that you created that was a breakthrough? Is there, is, did that happen? I mean, the, there was a, that was many years before. There was, we had this multimedia projector platform in 3M. And uh, and remember, we, we, we needed to innovate very quickly. And we didn't have really the time to innovate in the technology. So it was a pure uh, styling innovation and ergonomic innovation, but essentially we took the engine that was already existing, we changed the chassis style plus ergonomics, we doubled the sales of the product. That was really a breakthrough moment within the company many years before. Right. Many other businesses were like, wait a second, we need to do something with that new approach. And so I started to do more projects and then I grew. That's part also of the strategy that then I've been using in PepsiCo, same thing. Identify the low hanging fruit, identify a project or two where you can show the value of the different approach, even if it's not a perfect project, even if you need to take some trade off. As far as you show value, then you are gonna have more people that wanna be part of it, they're gonna invest in you. Uh, but, but, but you need to, therefore, to be very pragmatic, very concrete, you know, do tangible things that people can touch and feel and grow with you. This idea of, you know, immediately going all the way to bright is very naive. It's really about building things step by step in an organic way. Okay, okay I'm, getting a, uh, I'm getting a little motion over there that time, time has run out. Uh, they think they want to bring you some, uh, <laughs> some gift. Okay. First, Maro, Maro Porcini, everybody give him a hand and thank him very much. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. So, I'll start by uh, Harry and come on up and give this to Maro, Thank please. you. <laughs> That's for you and uh, we appreciate thank you coming you. and your time. Thank um, you. You open it now or later? Uh, you decide. No, open, it. <laughs> open it. What's in there? I open, open it? it. Okay, yeah. so in, while he's opening it, I just want to say one or two things to you. I first want to thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, I want to ask you a few things. I want to ask your participation. And what does that mean for me? I got involved in Exceed 10 years ago for one reason. Because I believe it's important, as Mauro said, to be a good person, to be a good human being and give back. So that's why I'm here, and I need you. And how, what do we need from you? For those of you that can, please see Irwin, myself, Harry, wow, Eli, or Alan, and say you want to help, and you want to be either a volunteer to help a small company, or give of your time in some way or another. So we need you. And any of you that do need help or support, please feel free to reach out to us, because we're here for you too. So I believe we have to give back, and I believe what makes us successful is giving back, and of course, as Mauro said, passion. <laughs> Don't give up, be persistent in everything that you want. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Before we go, before we go, we have to give a special thanks to Harry Towell. Without him, this night would never happen.
He has inspired and inspired everyone on the board to take Exceed to the next level. He did something tonight that has never been done before, and we all owe him a great debt of gratitude. Thank you, Harry. What'd you get? I want a picture. Take a picture.